Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 38th episode of VisionCon Live, your go-to nerdy talk show. I'm your host, Zach Wilson, but you didn't come here to see me today. You came to see the woman of the hour. She's Setsuna from Yashihime, 2B from Nier Atatama, Mitsuri from Demon Slayer, just to name a few. She's the legendary performer who has one of the largest ranges in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please tell me, welcome the one, the only, Kira Buckland. Kira, how are you doing today? Well, that, that was very kind of you to say, and I was going to say, don't sell yourself short. You never know. Some people could be coming to see your mug and hear your voice. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're here to see your voice or hear your voice, Kira, but thank <laughs> you. Thank you. How are you today? I am doing all right. I'm getting over a cold, so, um, you know, I don't sound too great right now, but trying to take care of things the best I can. Sure. I suppose no rest for the wicked. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kara, I did want to go ahead and get us started with, I want to ask you now, like I said in the intro, you're a household name, legendary performer, you know, countless people all across the world are fans and know you, but I want to ask where it all began. Now, was being one of the greatest performers of all time always the plan, or did something happen later in life that kind of brought you here today? Well, that is very flattering for you to say, first of all. Um, I, I don't know if I would necessarily agree with all that, but you know, I, I try my best and always try to give it my best performance. Um, yeah, I mean, I would actually say I wanted to be a performer starting from when I was like 12, but I wanted to be a singer for a while. So I was joking with my roommate the other day that I feel like I'll never achieve my like childhood dream of becoming a rock star, but you never know, you know, <laughs> maybe when I'm like in my fifties or something, I'll finally have that band. But um, yeah, it was kind of like, I liked performing, like I liked singing, I liked um, doing things vocally and I sort of liked acting, but I didn't really like being on stage or on camera so much, like... I don't know. It just kind of, I didn't really know like what voice actors were because when you're younger, you don't really think about it. You know, you're just kind of like, oh, the cartoons characters are just talking like you, I guess on some level know that there's a person voicing them, but you don't really think about that. Like that's a job that people do. So like probably in high school when I started getting more into like anime and video games, because I didn't really um, get to watch or play a lot of that stuff growing up. So I got into it a bit later in life, but then I kind of realized at the time that there were people who do voices. So um, I thought, oh, that would be really cool. And, you know, I grew up in Alaska. So it was like, obviously, there's not really opportunities to do acting and stuff there aside from like community plays or whatever, which I didn't really do that much of that kind of stuff. Um, but I knew somebody at the time who was like, oh, I do voices for flash animations on the site called Newgrounds. And yeah. so I kind of like looked that up. And, you know, that was one of the things where I really consider that just being in the right place at the right time because I kind of did this as a hobby and there weren't you know now there's so many people online who do voice acting but back in like 2004 2005 there really weren't a ton and especially on that site there weren't a lot of female voice actors so a lot of times for the female characters you would have animators doing their own voices or getting like their sister or mom or girlfriend to do it or like pitching their up their voice or using like a text-to-speech even some of them so I think just the fact that I'm like hey I'm a girl who can do voices you know it was like and back then everything was just like collaborative you know it wasn't like people were making money or getting paid or anything it was just kind of like people coming together and making creative stuff and I do kind of think that people growing up now trying to do voice acting are missing out on a lot of that because everything's rushing into like okay how can I monetize this and stuff like that and back in the day we just collaborated with people you know yeah. So. And, and for younger viewers uh, that don't know, Newgrounds was, oh my gosh, it was definitely, it was a product of its time, definitely, but man, was it a beautiful thing when it was in its heyday, at least. Uh, yeah, and you know, a lot of it was just kind of learning as you go, just kind of like teaching myself. Obviously, later I was able to get some acting training, which was very helpful and something that every actor will recommend if you want to go, even if you just want to go into VO, like you have to be an actor first. There's no way around that but um you know just kind of like I'm really grateful for all the time that I got to spend doing like flash animations and stuff because I felt like I could learn in an environment that wasn't as much pressure as when you're having to have your own business and like you know deal with clients who are paying you for a job and all that sort of thing 
Well, from Newgrounds all the way to where you are today, you've had a lot of roles in between, and I want to talk a few about a few of them. The first one, of course, is one of your most recent characters, and that, of course, is Setsuna from Yashahime. So, yes. obviously, if you're an anime fan, both young or old, obviously everyone is either familiar with or a huge fan of Inuyasha. Inuyasha is definitely one of the most popular animes of all time. And so for years and years, people have been screaming for a finally have a sequel series, which has finally came out. Now you voice Setsuna, one of the central characters of the sequel series. So how did it feel being a part of one of the most anticipated sequel series ever? Well, I was really surprised because I assumed, you know, when I first heard about the series coming out, I thought, oh, they're going to do it in Canada. Like they did the original series, you know? And so when I got the auditions, like I was so surprised because I just like, wait, what? I wasn't expecting <laughs> that, you know, but I didn't think that necessarily that I would be a good fit for Setsuna. I mean, of course, if I get an audition, I'm going to try for it because you never know. And that's proof right there. But, you know, I thought like, oh, well, I usually don't play characters maybe in this voice range or this personality type as much. So I don't know, but I'll still give it my best. And, you know, and then I got a call back, which I was really surprised about. And then when I found out I booked it, that was like really, really exciting for me. But one thing that I was also really happy about was that they got the original cast, like everyone they were able to get to reprise their roles. Because I know that, you know, if like nobody likes to be replaced on something, even if it's just a matter of, oh, this goes to a different studio or a different country to be worked on. So I thought it was so, so cool that whatever magic they were able to work to get like the Canadian cast and the new US cast and have everybody together on the same project. That is so cool. Especially because like I listened to their voices when I was first starting, you know, I used to watch the dub all the time. And that was one of the things that inspired me to be a voice actor for anime. I was about to say, I was introduced to the series back when uh, Toonami was still a huge thing, but back when I was growing up, I would always watch Toonami. So it's definitely, all of their voices are definitely ones that really resonate with me. So when I saw that a lot of them have reprised their roles, oh my God, I was hyped. But, you know, I will admit, and I'm sure a lot of other people uh, kind of join me in this, well, we might have been a little apprehensive or a little cautious with the sequel series, but I've been watching it like through and through as much as I can. And oh my God, like I, all that I've seen so far, as far as uh, Setsuna or just all the entire cast, like I've been nothing but shocked with how great it's been so far. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really good so far too. I've been keeping up with the series in Japanese as it comes out because, you know, I find it interesting and also because I want to prepare for when I record those episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no. Now, the, uh, the Japanese, which actually brings me to my second question regarding Setsuna. So with the dub not really being out quite yet, uh, how do you tailor the voices that you do in comparison to the Japanese voice actors? I try to follow it as close as I can. Um, you know, obviously it's like my voice is never going to sound 100% like someone else's, especially in another language. But at the same time, you know, it's very helpful because we preview every line right before we do it in the original language. So <clears throat> I hear the Japanese performance and then we go in and I come in and, and do my performance. And then our director, because um, it was just announced who the director was, Jalen Cassell, he's absolutely wonderful and everyone should go follow and give him some love. Um, and he was also one of the writers for JoJo's. Yay. But, um, you know, if sometimes he'll give me notes or sometimes somebody from biz will be sitting in and giving me notes and, um, you know, just to make sure that the line is, it carries that intent and that personality over and that it's going to fit with what the other girls are doing because Setsuna has a very different personality type than Moraha or even her sister Toa because obviously they grew up apart. So, you know, um, just kind of keeping within Setsuna's kind of more calm, mature, logical, <laughs> um, you know, warrior type, I guess I would say, as opposed to the other girls who are a little more hot headed. So, you know, having that whole team there kind of making sure that we stay in that zone is really helpful. Oh my God. As much as I love Toa, I am very excited to see Setsuna's kind of story progress the more. And, you know, obviously when the dub comes out as well, I'll revisit it. But uh, so far, Highly recommend it, guys. If you guys are watching this right now, either live on Facebook or later on YouTube, go check out Yashihime. Another role that I wanted to discuss a little bit is one that definitely I did not expect to blow up as much as it did. Then obviously when I eventually played the game, 
obviously I saw what all the hype was about. That, of course, is Tubi from Near Autonoma. So in the society that we live in, uh, one of the most popular video game genres is definitely the third person action games. So in a world where, you know, third person action games are very prevalent and very popular, I find that it really boils down to the characters and kind of their personalities that kind of kind of separate everyone from the fold. And I think that is definitely what brings Near Autonoma, you know, to what it is. And so, and I attribute a lot of that to your character, 2B. So while voicing 2B, did you ever expect Near Autonoma to blow up to the degree that it did? I had no idea. I don't think any of the cast knew that it was going to blow up like that. Because, you know, we all record so many projects. And there's been so many times where I recorded a really cool project and thought, oh man, like, I hope people like this. I, you know, we're really putting our all into this. It's going to be so great. And then it just kind of flew under the radar. And there's so many projects and like so many games and shows that are good, but they just don't really get the recognition that they deserve. So, you know, I had no idea that it was going to blow up the way it did. And by the time that it was starting to blow up, we had already finished recording. So I'm just like, oh gosh, I hope people like it. Well, like, but yeah, that one definitely, I would say, changed my career because it went from kind of like, oh, maybe like 10 people know of my work to like, you suddenly, it, you know, Everybody. being more public, it was very different. Because oh I remember when it was, you know, first announced and, you know, kind of talked about here and there, like I was expecting it to be kind of a write-off third-person action game, you know, kind of throw into the bin with all the other ones, but oh my God. It's, it's the characters, it's the world dynamic, it's just, and the gameplay, you know, yes, it's a third person action game, but it's just, it's so intense, yet also just really fun to control as well, and so, I don't know, it's just, and definitely Tubi's story, and, you know, obviously, by proxy, your portrayal of Tubi is really what makes the game, I think, stand out from the rest. I think it's kind of everything because, of course, you know, Yoko Taro's storytelling has always been incredible. And I heard that with some of the earlier games, there were some people who didn't like the gameplay as much. But with uh, Nier Automata, then you have like Platinum Games involved and the gameplay was really good and it's it switches things up and you kind of like have different tasks that you have to do and sometimes you're kind of like hacking and slashing through enemies and other times you're like doing the hacking thing when you play 9s's route and all this different stuff so it's like it's very unique the way it switches things up on you and you know the way that you have like kind of the multiple storytelling routes that you experience the game and i think there's all these things that just kind of combine together and make it amazing yeah all encompassing and it really is a truly important and mesmerizing game Speaking of mesmerizing and things blowing up, I can't think of a better example than Demon Slayer, where you play the character Mitsuri. Now, Demon Slayer, while yes, it is a shounen anime, it definitely has a pretty dark premise. I think we can all agree on that. However, our one shining light and, you know, just kind of beacon of, I don't know, hope, happiness, what have you, is definitely the adorable Mitsuri, which you play. So I did want to ask, was there anything about Mitsuri that you personally identify with, or maybe at the start, or maybe after you were done, kind of realized, you know, you share a lot of traits with Mitsuri? Well, she didn't get that much screen time in the anime, unfortunately. I really hope that there will be more in the future, because I know that I've been told she has a lot more in the manga, so hopefully yeah, yeah. <laughs> there'll be more stuff coming up for her. Um, I know this is very shallow, but I was excited because it was like another pink haired character. <laughs> well, I mean, she, she was very adorable. And yeah, she did have a kind of a more of a limited compared to other characters, but I don't know. Most people that I've talked to about the show, because I'm a huge fan of Demon Slayer, they have just, I don't know, it's something about Mitsuri, obviously. You know, the hair is cool, and, you know, the, you know, the outfit, say what you will. But I think it's honestly just, you know, the fact that in comparison to her peers, which are more kind of brooding, darkish, kind of stereotypical things you find in a shonen anime, she definitely like, does. Love! <laughs> exactly. She definitely brings a more lighthearted and, you know, kind of, kind of not comic relief, but definitely some leaf and brevity from the more serious topics of Demon Slayer. Yeah, she's kind of just there, like, fangirling, like, oh, he's so adorable, and stuff like that. <laughs> well, and speaking of kind of more dark premises of uh, certain things, I can think no better example than Danganronpa. Uh, now, you've always Hyoko, and, you know, 
A lot of people love Yoko, you know, whether, you know, it's the bratty-ish little charm or just, you know, that the deep down, she really is someone who cares about people. So in voicing Yoko, she's more, like I said, a little brattier and, you know, fun, but kind of with the dark premise that the game provides, were there any point in voicing Hyoko where the story, when the story goes a little bit more dark, did it make voicing her a little bit more difficult? Well, I was actually a fan of Danganronpa before I ever got cast for the game. So I knew kind of, you know, what the story was like and what happened in two and stuff like that. So I was aware of all that going in. Um, but I do think that some of, I, I like that you see some of her more vulnerable moments. Like you don't see them often, but I think even when you're playing a character who is really bratty or even a character who's kind of an antagonist in certain examples. Um, I learned one thing in an acting class once and I can't remember who said it, but it was like, no character is just a brat. No character is just a, a bully, you know, like everybody has some reason why they are what they are. And um, I don't know, I just definitely thought the the little tiny moments where we got to see Hiyoko's more vulnerable side were really cool because it kind of made her a more well-rounded character. I know a lot of people hate her and I don't judge you for that, but um, you know, at the same time, it was kind of nice having a few moments where she wasn't being totally awful, just as a contrast. <laughs> well, it was definitely those moments that made me come around her. Cause yeah, I mean, I'll admit initially I was like, Oh God, her. But then as I, the game progressed and, you know, I saw more of those moments. Granted, they were kind of few and far between, but <laughs> I just, I really enjoyed those moments. And that really made it an all-around character, which then made me very sad when, no spoilers, but, you know, something happened. <laughs> yeah, don't get attached to anybody in Danganronpa. <laughs> it's something you got to learn uh, uh, pretty soon. But uh, before we continue, guys, we're about at the halfway point, so I do want to uh, reiterate something. Now, if, uh, plenty of people have already either messaged VisionCon directly or put their comments and questions in the live chat. You guys still have time to do so, but I just want to remind you guys that you guys still have some time to, to do so before we get to the end. But the next topics I do want to talk about are, like I mentioned earlier, obviously you are a household name, Kira, uh, but a lot of people that watch the show obviously are here to see the amazing guests like the one that's right before me. However, we've also noticed that plenty of people who watch this show are either in the entertainment industry or are starting out or not really in the entertainment industry but want to be and just need to know what to do next. So with somebody as successful as you, I want you to keep those two, I want to keep you to keep that in mind as I ask these two questions. The first one being how you handle rejection. Now, oh. Now, you know, everybody knows rejection is, you know, a common part of life. However, if there was ever an industry where I would argue rejection is most prevalent, it would definitely be your industry, which, as we all know, is the entertainment industry. So for the folks watching at home that either want to get into the entertainment industry or already are and just want to know what to do next, how would you advise them to handle rejection? Does it get any easier? Or if it doesn't, how do you personally handle it? Okay, so that's actually a really good question. Um, I think I actually have a whole article on this. Um, if anyone is interested, you can find it linked on the website. I help admin voiceactingclub.com. Um, and there's a link to guides and articles. And there is one that I wrote where I go really in depth on this topic. But to just kind of summarize things, I think the first and most important thing to understand is that it really isn't rejection at the end of the day because a casting director might read a hundred or even more people for a role. So let's say, for example, you're auditioning for a character and there's 99 other actors with your same gender and overall voice type who are auditioning for that same role that you are. Obviously only one person can get the part. And those factors, some of it's gonna be really subjective. You know, they're taking into account, of course, your, your acting, your performance, but also how well do you suit that particular character? Because, you know, I can audition for a role where I'm like really forcing my voice into a range it doesn't wanna go. And someone else who naturally has that range and can worry a little more about their acting, you know, they're gonna have a better chance than, than I am at that particular character. Um, so, you know, obviously they can only choose one person for that role based on all these different factors, like voice, tone, performance, audio quality. Like there's so many things it's, you know, and sometimes it's just what that casting director wants to hear. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you did a bad job or the person who got the role is automatically better than you. It's just that, that somebody else was what they were looking for 
for that part. So the, the one person getting cast, that doesn't mean the other 99 or however many people are automatically bad or they fail or got rejected, right? It's just kind of like, okay, you weren't chosen for this particular part. Somebody else was, and that's okay because there's other opportunities and you move on and you move on. Um, you know, obviously the goal is that you don't get too attached to anything you read for because we get some opportunities to audition for very, very cool projects. And I know that I've auditioned for certain things, maybe even gotten callbacks for things where I'm like, I would have loved to be in this. I would have loved to book this character. I would have loved to even do an incidental in this show. And sometimes it's not meant to be, you know, maybe they, they just want to cast other people who they like the sound of for whatever reason, or the director knows those people and knows that they can bring them in and they'll be efficient. You know, it's, whatever. But um, I, I think it's really important. They call it like send and forget to just be able to kind of fire off those auditions and you're putting it out into the universe and being like, okay, I did my best. It's out of my hands now. And when you do book, it's a nice surprise because I've seen some actors say, oh man, I wish we got like rejection emails when we didn't book a part. And I'm like, no, that's like a horrible idea. It's so demoralizing because, you know, instead of just, you know, now it's like if we get an email back about an audition, it either means we got a call back or we're booked. But if we got an audition every time we, or an email every time we didn't get the part, it would be like, wow, that's depressing. Cause you'd see like 99, you didn't get the parts and then one or two, like, cool, you're cast. Cause that's what the odds are. You know, I think sometimes newer actors think like, oh, I auditioned for like 10 things and I only booked one of them. And I'm like, what? That's great. Like, that's a great booking ratio because it's so competitive right now. Well, see, it's interesting you say that about the not hearing anything back is a good thing because yeah, we've had plenty of guests previously who have said that. And I've always thought that was a little weird. Like, you know, these companies ghost you like, and that's like, you're not like heartbroken about that. But then now that you've mentioned it, well, I guess at the same time though, if I were in their shoes and like a company said like, yeah, we didn't book you, you know, sorry, not sorry. I'd be like, okay, actually, now that I think about it, that's probably worse. Yeah. And it's also just, you know, they don't have time. They're dealing with so many actors, so many different things. And I think it's a little bit different because I know some people have compared it to like, well, like for a job interview, you'd, you'd want to know if you didn't get the job. And it's like, yes, but it's not, you're not an employee, you know, like when you're an actor, it's like you're working on all different projects at once and, you know, you're just doing like contract work. So you're not like waiting around to see, oh, did I book this one thing? You're just on to the next thing, you know? And it's kind of like you just, fit in your scheduling when you book things because ultimately we're working on like maybe five or six projects at a time you know Oof, where, where's the where's their time to sleep <laughs> well but it's you know that's the other thing to go back to rejection is it's a drought or a flood as people say so sometimes you'll have weeks where you're like hardly booking anything you hardly have any sessions and that's really hard and then other times you're just like oh man I'm so busy I can't you know so it's like, it's never stable. Like, that's why so many people have day jobs for a really long time too, because it's like, you don't know when your next acting job is going to come in, but you know that if you work at, you know, the, the coffee shop or whatever, that you can have that stable income. Mm -hmm. Well, the next question before we get to the plug zone is kind of jumping off on some of the advice that you just gave, where again, people either want to get in the entertainment industry or are, but need to know what to do next. So what advice would you give the folks watching at home right now that maybe you wish you had starting out or just any advice that you could give them to either get into the entertainment industry or get, you know, more leveled up to maybe better their acting skills or just kind of be a more well-rounded actor and performer? Well, there's so many free resources out there now. Like, you know, this isn't just to say like, yes, I make free resources, which I mean, I do, but there's a lot of other good resources out there. There's, um, you know, like I write articles, but there's also like a lot of people who do free YouTube resources, podcasts, like there's so many different free ways to learn about the industry and learn about acting. And obviously that's not a substitute for actually like acting but at the same time you know there's a lot of information out there that I wish that I had 15 years ago when I was first starting out you know we all had to just kind of figure it out back in my day you know on on AOL message boards or well, maybe not quite that long ago but you know what I mean like um you know now it's it's accessible for people to get good like decent quality equipment at home to record because when I first started out you know it was like you didn't have like home studios, maybe like 
really rich actors did, but like hobbyists, we were just using whatever, you know, <laughs> like Windows Sound Recorder. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when Audacity came out and that was like the biggest deal. But, um, you know, now it's like there's stuff that you can get for relatively cheap that's decent, at least to do like hobby projects. And, you know, I think that's the other thing too. Like, don't turn your nose up at just doing like small collaborative things online. Now, of course, you don't want to get taken advantage of. You don't want to, um, you know, be doing free work for people who should be paying you like of course but at the same time there's a lot of people just like youtubers like um students trying to make like a student project like a game design final there's like small indie creators just trying to like put something out people doing um audio dramas that sort of thing like there's all of these projects that don't really have like budget but they need people who just want to help out and kind of get their name out there and I think stuff like that is a great place to start because it's low pressure you know and um, that's kind of like how I started how a lot of people that I know started is just doing the kind of stuff online and then of course like you you have to take acting classes I mean there's some people who don't and they naturally have really good instincts but they're the unicorns um, for everyone else <laughs> Like I would start with group classes and then after that you can move on to working with a coach one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you can ask, you know, your actor friends because different coaches will be better for different people. But, you know, I still take coaching sometimes. Like I still take classes. So do all my peers because you're constantly always trying to improve and get better and up those chances of booking. So, you know, anyone will tell you it's like the acting is the most important part because you can learn to do all sorts of stuff with your voice. You can just, you know, listen to games or cartoons or whatever you're watching and you can just kind of like try practicing doing what the actors do just to get used to like changing your voice and all that but you know doing voices is not what's going to get you booked it's going to be can you create a sustainable performance as this character can you embody all facets of that character you know we mentioned Hyoko if I'm playing a character like Hyoko yeah like 90% of the time I'm just being loud and bratty and obnoxious but when it comes to her being like sad, I have to be able to carry that, you know, and you, you have to stay in that voice. You have to stay in that character archetype, but at the same time have all facets of that character. So, you know, that's why being an actor, even if you don't have access to like voice acting specific classes, is going to be really helpful. And now with COVID and stuff, there's a lot of teachers and coaches who do like Zoom lessons and online classes. So it's so much more accessible than when you had to be in LA or Texas to do one of these. Sure. Well, guys, I hope you took notes because now you have all the tools necessary to become the next gear of Buckland. All righty, guys. Well, real quick, like I said, this is your last chance. If you guys haven't already, either message VisionCon directly or it, put it in the live chat, obviously, if you're watching this live on Facebook, because this is your last chance to do so. Because ladies and gentlemen, we're in the plug zone. Kira Buckland, now is your opportunity to either plug, promote, advertise, whatever verb you want to use, anything you want, the floor is yours. Cool, yeah, so I mean, I know I mentioned before that I help admin a community for people, like actors of all levels. So that could be, you're looking to get started, you're maybe doing some stuff as a hobby and you're not really sure, all the way to like, you're a working pro. And we have this community so that people can kind of ask each other questions, mentor each other. Cause as much as I wish I could answer every person who reaches out to me and asks for advice on things, it's like, you know, I, I just can't, I don't have time to do that as much as I wish I could. So that's why like, we have this whole community. I write a, a ton of articles um, from everything that's like, you know, oh, here's some acting techniques or whatever to like the stuff that nobody really wants to talk about. Like I said, how to deal with rejection or um, I have one that's really popular about dealing with jealousy and envy because no one wants to admit that that's the thing that happens. <laughs> so um, it's called Voice Acting Club. Our site is just voiceactingclub.com. There's a link to the Discord server. We have a message board, but you know, obviously a lot of kids these days like to talk in real time on Discord. So that's kind of where everything is. You know, when you join the server, definitely lurk for a minute, read the rules. It's, we've got like over 8,000 people. So, you know, it can be a little 
intimidating at first, but um, it's also open to content creators. So if you're like an artist, writer, game designer, sound designer, anything like that, yeah. we have, um, you know, especially if you're looking for voice actors for your project, we have places where people can post, whether it's just nonprofit projects looking for people to collaborate or like, hey, we're, um, we're hiring voice actors for something. So it's just like our, our motto is like, connecting voice actors and content creators. So it's basically, you know, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm making this like indie project and I just don't know how to find voice actors. And it's like, okay, here you go. Here's like an organized community, thousands of actors who are looking to work for you and vice versa. <laughs> and then where can people find you? You know, let's say if they want their, I don't know, daily dose of Kira Buckland, is there any social media websites that you're on? Yeah, I'm most active on Twitter. It's just my name, so it's pretty easy to find me. I have a Facebook business page. Um, you can probably find that if you search me as well. And then I sort of have an Instagram, but I'm not very active on there, so it's mostly just pictures of my cat. <laughs> and obviously because events, like live events, aren't a thing during COVID and for the foreseeable future, I do have an online autograph shop. It's on Store Envy, so if anyone wants to get like a signed art print, you can get one on there. We ship anywhere in the world and you can also buy a print of my cats if you are interested. And some of the money from the cat prints will go to help cat rescue organizations. Oh my God, that is so sweet. I'm a crazy cat lady. <laughs> well, I mean, in this case, it's a good thing. Now, real quick, I'm gonna go ahead and actually share my screen real quick so we can take a look at some of the stuff that you have for sale. Give me just one second. Yeah. Set up. And there's always going to be new stuff in the works, you know. I, I have like two more commissions that are being done right now. All right, there we go. So you got a pretty much. <laughs> I love this cat one right here. Yeah, that's the uh, art of one of my cats specifically. Oh my gosh, yeah. So we got a bunch of different characters, guys. So, and it's kirabucklin.storeenvy.com. And I didn't mention this, but I have a bunch of these links gonna be right here in the live chat if you're watching this later on, or right now on Facebook, or if you're watching this later on YouTube, all of these links and more are gonna be down there in the description box below. So go ahead and check those out. Let me share my screen real quick. All right. And with that said, guys, we're out of the plug zone and going right into viewers' comments and questions. So like I usually do, guys, it's just gonna be just the same. I'm gonna do half from the messenger and half from the live chat. So give me one sec to pull that up. All right, so Sarah tuned in and wanted to say, hi Kira, I loved you as Umi from Love Live School Idol Project. Do you have any fond memories or experiences voicing Umi? Yeah, um, I used to be super addicted to the Love Live mobile game. Like, it's kind of embarrassing how much money I spent on the Love Live mobile game. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was really, really excited for a chance to audition for it. I was very surprised that I booked Umi because, again, um, I just didn't think that that would be the one that I was cast for. But, you know, it was a really fun challenge. And it was just like, so cool getting to be a part of something like that. I wish we got to do the songs, but you know, they don't do that a lot in anime anymore. Sure. Well, a bunch of people messaged uh, the live chat, you know, obviously Aaron messaging saying he's already checking out Yashihime first in subs and then hopefully more dubs in the future. Uh, Linda tuned in and asked, what are some of your favorite moments of voicing 2V in Nier Atari? I really, really liked the parts where 2B got to show a little more emotion because, you know, most of the time it's like, well, you know, I won't like go into it because spoilers for anyone who still hasn't played it, but you know, she has reasons, I'll just say for why she is very emotionless most of the time. And some of that stuff I was discovering as we went on recording and I was learning more about the character and her backstory. So um, the moments where she, you know, especially where you can kind of tell how much she cares about 9S. Like, those, like, broke my heart to record. Oh, my God, yeah. There were some, uh, honestly, the game is very, I mean, it's very action-heavy, but also, you know, it definitely has that lore aspect about it, but I was not expecting this to be a game that I actually cried over. Oh, yeah. If you don't cry over to your, like, oh, you'll, you'll cry over, like, machines in that game. Oh, my God. And Linda did a second question that I actually really liked and I wanted to spotlight. So she wrote in and said, so a bit of a question again. I've always been curious about voice acting, but at the same time, I'm rather shy when it comes to it because I'm not native to the U.S. and I have an accent 
when I talk as I'm a Spanish speaker. I never made the attempt, but hard is it for voice actors that weren't born? Okay, I think she means, I never made the attempt, but is it hard for voice actors that weren't born in the US and are not a native English speaker? So it is going to be harder. I'm not going to lie. Um, but at the same time, there are some more opportunities now for authentic foreign accents. So um, there's, you know, there's a couple options. There's voice acting in your native language because sometimes like if you live in the US but you are bilingual, sometimes they will just want to hire people from within the US, um, but to do, you know, Spanish voiceover, French voiceover, all that kind of stuff because it's easier than uh, like hiring people internationally and stuff like that. So that can be something that's really helpful. And also sometimes there's, projects like games and stuff like that that want authentic accents. Um, you don't see it as much in anime because for most of the time in anime they want everyone to kind of have like a neutral American accent unless the character is supposed to be from somewhere else like somewhere outside Japan. But um, you know like for games and stuff like that like I think Overwatch is a really good example of how they had characters who spoke with authentic accents and um, you, you're just seeing it a lot more in general. So I think there are those opportunities out there and if that's something that you can provide it's you know it may in some ways limit the opportunities for certain types of roles that you can do but in other ways it can be an asset that can help you and i think um if you know if it's something like you really want to work on being able to get rid of an accent when you need to for the purpose of playing certain roles you can work with a dialect coach who specializes in that because um i know for example there's actors who maybe come from like australia or something like that and they have to do an american accent for all their roles so you know it's definitely possible mm -hmm. and linda if you want a more kind of more to more on that topic if you want to go to VisionCon's YouTube channel and find our episode with Carolina Ravasa. Her and I actually talk a lot about that in depth during that episode. She is Sombra from Overwatch. So if that helps, you know, that is available to you. Um, all right, let me pull up the next one. Okay, so Rob tuned in and wanted to know what are some of your favorite hobbies outside of voice acting? I like playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know, like I liked um, like cosplaying and stuff like that, but now that events aren't really a thing, I haven't done that in a while. Um, I like makeup, fashion, that sort of stuff. Taking care of lots of cats, I started taking care of some stray cats in addition to my own. Um, and like classic rock music is a really big thing for me too. <laughs> All right, so let me find, uh, there was a really good one. Ah, here it is. Okay, so Trevor tuned in and wanted to know what are some of your characters that you've voiced over the years that you think you would be friends with if they existed? Oh, um... Look at you, Trevor. Yeah. I, I think I'd want to be friends with, like, a lot of the really positive characters, but at the same time, I wonder if they would get on my nerves. Like, I'd love to hang out with Heart Ino from Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, but at the same time, I could see her being like, it's the power of love, and me being like, all right, no, power of coffee, I need some more of that now. Um, but yeah, I think I would like to hang out with some of the more wholesome characters that I play. Like, Mitsuri <laughs> would be pretty fun, and Satsuna, just because she could, like, beat up anyone I had a problem with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so Aaron tuned in, and we got about time for about two more, guys. So I'm going to go over to Aaron. He said, which Disney descendant would Sexuna want to hang out with? Mal? I think that, yeah, Mal, daughter of Maleficent and Hades, Ben, son of Belle and Beast, or Kiera and, what is that? Okay, uh, Kior, or Keon, Simba, and Nala's Cubs. Apologies if I mispronounced any of those. Uh, Simba and Nala's Cubs, probably. <laughs> All right, let me bring up the last question. Da, 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 da. Okay, so Natalie tuned in and wanted to know, are there any characters that you've voiced over the years that you wish would have more recognition? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some that I bring up quite a bit. I know Evie from Paladins is one that I always bring up because I had so much fun. Like, that's the most I ever got to kind of, like, 
be myself in a character in a sense because I'm still obviously playing a character but she's kind of like a crazy meme lord um <laughs> there's another character called Acquire Chan from Akiba's Beat that was also like got almost no recognition but it's the same thing like she even got to make a Jojo reference which I was so happy about um uh, Serafina from Disgaea 5 like I will say like she got some recognition but definitely not as much as I wish and I was also really proud of one of my earlier performances, which was Hydra Bell from Blood Lad. Did we lose you? Nope. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I thought there was, there was Computer like- Computer could have cut out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fine. All right. Well, awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, that's about all the time we got for episode 38 of Vision Con Live. So thank you guys so much for watching. And before we wrap things up, Kira, any final thoughts to leave us on? Oh, um... I don't know. <laughs> I can't really think of anything else in addition to what I already said, but sage like yeah. advice and whatnot. Yeah. Um, help cat rescues. <laughs> oh yeah. Cannot think of a better thing to note to leave it on. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 38 of vision con live. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Of course, I'm your host, Zach Wilson, but much more importantly, this has been my very special guest, Kira Buckland. Make sure to check out all the links down in the description box below and make sure to support Cat Rescue. But until next time, guys, always remember that life's better when you have friends to share it with.